I've been chasing this Bronco story for a while now. The history, the passion, the company intrigue, and it's been fun. But today is different. Today is huge. I finally got permission to see the most secretive room in the most secretive building in all of Ford. It's the legendary S Studio, not for Sonari. But it's the legendary S Studio at the Dearborn Product Development Center, also known as the place where all the cool stuff happens. Now, to be clear, I got this opportunity way back in the spring, long before the public got a look at the new Broncos. That is why I'm so pumped. Oh, I'm, I'm excited to go to a design facility because normally when you go, they make you sign your life away can't take no pictures they're not gonna let us take pictures here either like they they are they got the special sauce and they are trying to hide it and we might see a clay model that's gonna be a car we haven't even heard of yet there is nothing more satisfying than thinking up an idea in your head and seeing it in the world and that's what you get to do Inside, there is security, and yeah, they made me put my phone away. No Instagram posts for you here. Then it's a long, long walk down a couple of hallways. Yeah, it's crazy. Are we there yet, Papa Smurf? (laughs) (laughs) The building is huge. The halls are long and wide for forklifts and things like that. And most of the staff use golf carts to get around. And on the walls are photos of all the cars they've designed. The Ford Thunderbird, the original Mustang, and yep, the 1966 first generation Bronco. Oh my goodness, this is, this is a little stunning. I'm Sonarin Glenton, and this is Bring Back Bronco, the untold story. The Bronco was born in a time of unrivaled prosperity. America as a whole, and Detroit in particular, were flying high. But in the 90s, it fell victim to outside forces. In 1996, Ford shut down the whole program. But now, after 25 years of purgatory, it's back. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to finally announce that we are bringing back the Ford Bronco in 2020. But how do you build a 4x4 that will live up to a quarter century of anticipation? This is Chapter 8. Hold on tight. Early in 2020, while the design team was putting the final touches on the new Bronco, they allowed me into the studio. This is what I sounded like. That's kind of nuts, isn't it? Oh, wow. It looks like, you know, what's interesting about it, it's bigger than, I always think about this thing that there's, it looks so. So yeah, I am not usually at a loss for words like that, but what I'm looking at is the new Bronco. This doesn't look like an explorer or an expedition or a. I'm one of the first non-Ford employees in the world who gets to see it. I, yeah, I have no words for this. All I wanted to do was grab the door handle and jump in, but I can't. Kind of like this, is this a this clay? It's a clay model, sculpted then covered in a foil wrap so it looks and even feels like it's made of metal. The clay is shaped by machines, you know, big robots with spinning knives on the end of a six foot long mechanical arm. But the finer work is done by artists. Uh, we're just scraping the clay. We brought this side up. See how there's a little bit of difference from side to side? Real people, like Eric Wallace, a master model. What they want to do is put a peak in the center before it's too flat, so we're going to add up one side, and we'll add the other side. Now, so this is like now he's working on the hood. It's not perfectly flat. This iteration has a little ridge line down the middle. Uh, just scraping it down. 
And then to make sure we don't get it too flat, we have these here just to get a really nice uniform surface. Then they're gonna scan it. When they scan it, then they'll mill what I did on this side over to this side. The process goes back and forth. A robot cuts it according to a design created in 3D software. Then Eric sculpts the finer parts by hand. Then they scan it, create a new 3D model, refine it, and repeat. Wow. I How wanted did... to do this right out of high school back in 86, and my uncle's an engineer here, and he's like, no, he's like, you don't want to go that route. He's like, it's all going to be computers and mills, and they're not going to be doing the hands-on anymore. But that was the mindset back in the, you know, the 80s. They thought the mills and computers were going to take over, and this is just going to go away. But some of the changes, we can't, the mill can't do them as fast as we can do them by hand because there's so much more involved. And, and what, what, do you, what do you think you add that that machine can't do? The human touch. This is the part I love. It's organic. This is art. It's a twist of Eric's wrist and just a millimeter of clay comes off the model. And wow, just like that, you're looking at a different vehicle. But how do you get to that point? I mean, how do you know if Eric should scrape just a little more clay off or leave a little more on? Well, that starts with an old friend from chapter five. It gets green lit in the studio before the major investment gets spent. That's Maury Callum. He was the designer behind the bright red U260 concept 18 years ago, the one that was killed when Ford realized they had too many SUVs in their lineup. He's now got a little more gray in his beard and he's also a vice president. For the new Bronco, he had the job of assembling the design team. It's funny because um, when the 66 was designed, and it was designed around about the same time as the first Mustang back then, you know, everyone wanted to work in Mustang. No one wanted to work in Bronco because it was just it was just a farm truck back then. And now, of course, it's the opposite. Everyone everyone wants to work in Bronco now because it's such, a, such an icon to the company. The guy he tapped as lead designer was another European import, Paul Wraith. When I joined this project, honestly, I... You know, I was actually quite unfamiliar with Bronco. You know, I've been living in Europe most of my life. Paul is an interesting choice for the job. He's an outsider, a calming influence in a crazy time. So I, you know, I come to this studio in North America. There's a lot of excitement around the vehicle, but I didn't feel, you know, utterly compelled that I have to work on this thing because I have a backstory with it. I was just fascinated about it as a conundrum. And I, and I think that was probably advantageous that I wasn't, I just didn't want to dive straight into the sketches. I just wanted to sort it all out and get, get everything in order. He started by trying to understand what makes a Bronco a Bronco. It's had such a long and complicated and interesting and diverse history. How do you pull that back, all of that complexity? How do you pull that back to something as simple as maybe just two words? Yeah, so Paul wanted to pack 50 years of heritage into two words. Two words that would become the focus of everything they do. It could be tough and dependable or wild and fun. Maybe mix it up and go sporty and practical. There are infinite possibilities. You know, a picture paints a thousand worlds. And if you can't settle necessarily on two words perfectly, then maybe use pictures to support that kind of thinking. So he started taping photos to the wall of his office. There are pictures of Broncos on there. There are pictures of other vehicles uh, on there. There are pictures of uh, moments, lifestyles, landscapes materials, uh, there's, this, it's a, there's a really big range. And then he invited other designers to add to it. What was really cool was that, you know, there's such passion for the product that we found that parts of our leadership were in there as well, sorting through images, taking images off the wall, putting images on, adding post-it notes, taking other post-it notes off, working with us, curating it. And this is the, you know, this is the head of the company and they're doing that as well. Okay, it's not quite the level of involvement that Paul Axelrad showed by getting knocked unconscious during the field test of the original Bronco back in Chapter 1. But it is cool to imagine Bill Ford, the chairman of the board, in the design studio cutting out pictures from magazines and pinning them to the wall with a thumbtack. And what was wonderful was just that sense of alignment. We all got it. We've preserved that as a reference point for pretty much everything that we do. In the end, they did manage to distill all those images, all those emotions, and all those ideas into just two words. Trusted and carefree. Of all the words in the English language, we settled on trusted and carefree. Trusted and carefree. I can dig it. The challenge, of course, is to turn that idea into a truck.
The starting point was the original, the first generation Bronco. And they had old blueprints and hand-drawn sketches, which is great, but designing a car isn't done on paper anymore. It's done on computers with 3D models. Some would be great to have a 3D model of a, of a, of a Bronco. This is where Maury, the vice president, stepped in. We don't have any 3D data from the 60s because it didn't exist. We said, well, there's one way to do that. The solution was sitting outside in Maury's executive parking space. Yes, I, I've, got a, I've got a 76 Bronco now, yes. So I bought it about 10 years ago, and uh, it's the one my wife actually likes driving in the most. Because <laughs> you can see out of it, it's got lovely thin pillars, it's really nice, really nice airy vehicle. The 76 is 10 years into the production cycle, but it's pretty much indistinguishable from the original 66s. My Bronco is here, so I said, well, let's scan that. And then we, we got ourselves a digital model of a Bronco. Thing is, modern 3D scanning, it's kind of unforgiving. The, the interesting thing, when you, when you scan a vehicle that's 45 years old, it's, uh, and even the, the, the construction methods back then probably weren't as good as they were now because it's not symmetrical. So you have to pick side which you want to use. You know, and the thing, you know, things are four or five millimeters apart everywhere, you know, so you have to decide which side you want to use as, as, as a good side. Because we all have a good side, right? It was just nice to have a digital 3D model of a Bronco, just to say that, that, that you can compare the two. Because we're using a lot more virtual reality these days, so we can, we can actually walk around a model in, in, in virtual reality in 3D. And so it's a, it, was, it, was a fun, it was a fun thing to do. Maury isn't the only senior executive at Ford with a Bronco in his driveway. Turns out the new CEO has one as well. It's Ginger. It's a Ranger package, so it's like got all the options. That's Jim Farley, Ford's top executive. Might as well wear hush puppies and listen to ABBA. It's so 70s inside. It's all brown shag carpeting, got an eight track player. It's got dual tanks, the low off road rear end. It's just so awesome. And it's original, it's not perfect, but it's got 50,000 original miles and hasn't been touched. It's what you would call a sweet ride. But the road ahead won't be a trip down memory lane. There's some tough decisions that need to be made. So I have a very different vantage point than a lot of Ford people. Ford people are like, hey, bring back the Bronco to be a home run. Ah, uh, this is not my first rodeo. It's not that simple. Now, after seven and a half chapters of people talking about how amazing the Bronco was, is, and will be, you're probably wondering why the CEO is saying, it's not that simple. Well, you see, when he says, this is not my first rodeo, it's because, well, Jim used to be an executive at Toyota. We had the same idea. Let's bring back the FJ was the original, FJ40 was the original off-roader from the 60s and 70s. Let's bring back the same thing. And just like the Bronco, the FJ had been out of production for decades. And the FJ Cruiser had just as much hype as the Bronco does right now. The new truck had a couple of good years, then faded away. And I was incredibly informed by, you know, what you would argue the failure of FJ Cruiser. What he learned is that the brand power of an old name can be short-lived. When you get out of the market and get back in, there will always be a loyal fan base that will be there when it comes back. But then when everyone who wanted one has one, then what do you do? To answer that, Jim looked at brands that have shown longevity. The power of a brand, the consistency of a Mustang, the consistency of Wrangler, there's value in that. People count on the brand, it changes over time. The current Wrangler is nothing like the Willys Jeep from the 50s. You know, they've created a, a product that really is aspirational to young and old and is very usable as an everyday vehicle. The Mustang never started as a sports car. It was a commuter car. And now it's a sports car. It turned into something new along the way. When you have that continuity over decades, the owner base is consistent. The imagination of the vehicles is consistent, but what always relevant, it changes with the times. Just to recap, Maury, the VP of design, he has a Bronco. And you know, he's told Paul, the lead designer, how his wife loves the high driving position and those thin pillars. 
And then Jim Farley has a Bronco, and I'm sure he's talked Paul's ear off about shag carpet interior. And then there's the custodian, a woman from sales. Everyone Paul met had a story that he just had to hear. And so what we'd hear in, in, our, in our meetings was uh, comments like, well, I'll tell you what a new Bronco should be. It should be. And then they would talk about their Bronco or their dad's Bronco or the one that their relative had or their best mate had at university. Uh, they'd tell us about the one that their friend was restoring or the one that they crashed. Or they'd walk in with a model car in their pocket. You know, and this would be like, this is what the Bronco should be. This is what it means to me. Every day, a different person, a different story, a different Bronco. And what was really cool is that that was all over the map. With all those stories in his head, Paul couldn't narrow it down to just one. Uh, we actually designed for five very different people. And these are real people that really exist in the world. This is a completely new way of approaching design. What would typically happen on any new vehicle program is you got to tell the team, here's who the customer is. That's Mark Gruber again. Now he's on the marketing side and he's trying to talk to Paul, who is a designer. Traditionally, you could do stuff like, oh, okay, well, here's the type of media that they consume or here's the demographics of that customer or here's the top purchase reasons. And frankly, on a lot of programs, a lot of that stuff kind of just turns vanilla and it gets kind of lost. All right, I get it. Because knowing if your target customer listens to Eric Church or if they listen to Drake is cool and all, but it's really hard to connect the dots from that to, well, what shape the dashboard should be or what should the rear bumper look like? And that is what the design team really needs to know. They, they really wanted to understand, but frankly, they just didn't kind of get kind of how marketing would kind of talk about the customer. They're like, well, what the heck do I do with this? You know, what am I supposed to do with it? And so instead of words, they used people. I actually brought in real customers into these sessions and had them actually speak in the meetings themselves. We literally had the, the senior leadership, you know, talking to these customers firsthand and their attention span internally just changed dramatically. We were like, oh, I'm really interested in this, right? I'm not just hearing more, you know, BS or mumble jumbo from a internal thing. This is a real customer. I want to listen to what they have to say. So everybody got to know those five customers really well. We had Bianca, who's from uh, LA. She was a nanny, 21 years old. Very different lifestyle experience than Seth, who's an off-road and driving enthusiast, um, who's really pushes you know, his vehicle and himself to the limit and heavily modifies the vehicle. Those two characters are miles apart. We had Alex, we had Dave, and we had James. And they're all super different. And the way they use their vehicles is also super different. We try and simulate a day in the life of these people, work out what's working well, what's, what's not working out at all well. Bianca, for example, wants to go mountain biking. So the designers put a bike rack on the roof. Well, that makes sense until you remember that you're designing for someone who's five foot two and probably going to struggle to lift a 10 kilogram bike above their head on a vehicle this size. So how do we verify that? Well, we go out into the parking lot with a bike and then we go and see how difficult that is. And then we go back to the drawing board and we go, we need to find a solution for this. How can we make this experience better? You know, and is, is the roof rack the right place for it? And that problem, you know, is different for each one of those users. So uh, some of our other users are very tall and they could probably pull it off. Some of them are probably not going to be riding a bike in the first place. We do that all the way through each customer in turn until we've got a collection of ideas that are different, strong and relevant to the person and also the brand. Design Studio S looks like the Hot Wheels collection of an ill-adjusted kit. There are a whole bunch of cars, but very few of them are all in one piece. There's a bunch of automotive Frankensteins, really. The doors are ripped off, or some don't even have a back end. There's one that doesn't have a roof, but it's rigged with the virtual reality camera and headset so you can pretend that you're going for a drive in the desert. There's even a fan for wind and a heat lamp. And over in a corner is a modern Baja racer version. It's a two-seater, 
entirely made out of styrofoam. But back up against the wall is something big, covered up by a tarp. And under the tarp is the final twist in this whole Bronco saga. You grab that side. I'll grab this side. All right. All right, so just what are you guys going to do? Well, they're, they're, pulling off that, they're pulling off the tarp for me. I almost, I wanted to pull it off myself, but oh my God, that looks great. It's a four-door Bronco, y'all. For 30 years of production, Bronco was only a two-door. Actually, demand for four-door SUVs is one of the main reasons they stopped production. Everything gets bigger. <laughs> You know, the older Bronco was physically smaller, but this four-door version, we would recognize as being a full-size SUV. It's truly modern and powerful and has four doors. I can't believe they actually built a Bronco that has four doors. Literally the first time in 25 years that I've desired a car is this one. That's crazy. This is the car I want. That is nuts. You know, to describe it, and this is definitely going to sound like marketing lingo, but it really does look trusted and carefree. Look, I'm a Bronco fan, but I know my place in the world. There are definitely many more people whose opinions mean way more than mine. First of them, Tom Broberg, the publisher of Bronco Driver magazine, and Jeff Trapp, the founder of the Bronco Graveyard. The new ones is just lights out. It just... When you see it, you're going to say, my God, they nailed it right on the head. Quite a bit of the old guys are going to buy the new Bronco, but you're going to see a whole new genre of Bronco owners. You know, I think you're going to get a lot of crossover Jeep guys that are going to come, once they see the Bronco, what it can do and what it will do, you know, they're going to eat into a little bit of that four-letter word market. We've been following the story of the city of Detroit as it mirrors the rise and fall of the Bronco. The Bronco was launched when Detroit was at its height, and it was canceled when the city was in decline. So now, as the Bronco is returning to the roads, how is the city of Detroit doing? Well, the best way to answer that is to give you an update on the train station that I told you about back in Chapter 3. It's 1913, the year after the Titanic sank and the year before the Panama Canal opens. Closer to home, Ford Motor Company had just introduced the first moving assembly line. So now, instead of 12 and a half hours to build a chassis, it takes less than three. Not far away from that assembly plant, on the other side of Detroit, crowds are bustling back and forth inside of a massive entry hall Many of them stopped to check the time on the giant iron clock on the far wall. This is Detroit's new train station. Everyone calls it the Detroit's train station, but officially it's Michigan Central train station. That's Bailey Sasoy Moore, my Detroit historical tour guide. If you shipped out to World War I or World War II, you mustered at Fort Wayne here in Detroit, you were taken by bus to the train station, and you went to basic from that train station. That's the place where my forebearers kissed their loved ones goodbye and sent them off to war. When it was built, Detroit had a population of 200,000. In the next 15 years, that number tripled, with most of those new citizens arriving through this very building. When Henry Ford announced the $5 a day wage, it triggered the greatest migrations of Americans in this country's history. More people came to Detroit chasing that $5 a day wage than went to California for the gold rush. My grandfather was one of them. For him and thousands of others coming from the South looking for work, this building was their first impression of the city. Walking out into Roosevelt Park, seeing the skyline in the distance, hearing the noise, smelling the sense of the food. The spirit of unstoppable success continued for decades, but not forever. The station closed in 1988. The doors were locked and the building abandoned. Within a decade, it had been thoroughly looted. The glass was gone from every one of its 1,284 windows, and it looked out over the city with empty, haunting eyes. It had gone from being a symbol of Detroit's success to being an icon of its downfall. For 25 years, the Michigan Central Station sat in darkness. 
But today, the building is coming back to life. It was bought by Ford in 2018, and it's in the middle of a complete restoration. Not as a train station, but as the centerpiece for a new mobility division within the company. It will house research and development for autonomous electric cars, scooters, and light rail. In 1913, it was the hub of modern transportation, and the plan is to make it that again. Rise, fall, get back up again. That's the story of this station, the story of Detroit, and it's the story of the Bronco. The new Bronco will have a two-door version and a four-door version, but that's not all. Remember back in chapter one, Ted Ryan, the archivist, told me this. There were three different models that came out the first year. The wagon, which is the one with the top. The Roadster does not have a top. And then they called it the Short Roof Sport Utility. That was later changed to be the the Bronco Sport. Ah, yes, the Bronco Sport, a model that was built from 66 to 72. And here I am in 2020, standing in the middle of the design studio, face to face with a Bronco that looks different, yet oddly familiar. Yeah, look, look, the smaller ones, I think, will surprise people because they look like the original SUV. This smaller version is actually the 2021 Bronco Sport. It's smaller than the other models, basically the size of an Escape, but with a rugged, boxy front end. Now, one of the engineers told me, if you're going to drive over a mountain, you want the regular Bronco. But this one definitely will get you to the trailhead. So, just like that, The Bronco brand is a family once again. So here we are. Rise, fall, rebirth. It's all complete. But before I say goodbye, there's one more Bronco fan I want you to meet. My name is Matthew Rye. I'm from the Pacific Northwest, a little town called Mount Vernon up here in Northwest Washington. He's 25 years old, and if you drive by his house, he'll definitely slow down to take a second look. You would see a mint 1970 Bronco. It's a really pretty blue. It's a, like, almost a blue violet with a powder-coated white top. Uh, it's beautiful. It's on about nine inches of lift. It's real tall. It's on 39-inch tires, two-inch wheel spacers, so it's real, real aggressive looking. It looks like somebody took a factory Bronco and put it on like a Gravedigger suspension, but it still looks really cool. It's just a really cool looking rig. The Bronco originally belonged to his dad, a construction worker with three rowdy boys. He was a hardworking man that enjoyed doing things with his sons. Two years ago, Matthew's dad passed away, brain cancer. He was 54 years old. Man, my dad was... I think you would get along good with him. My dad was something special. I think they broke the the mold of him. So now Matthew's making that old Bronco a one of a kind. That restoration project has introduced him to a whole new world, the world of Bronco Nation. Yeah, so the community has been great to me. I'm a young buck and there's a lot of stuff on Broncos I just straight up did not recognize. Now, most of the Bronco experts he deals with are twice his age, but that's not the only thing that makes it different than other car clubs he's a part of. Some people, you know, I don't know, let's just say Camaro world, you know, you just feel like a stiff arm, like, oh, you know, mine's better. You know, I I I just don't feel like that in the Bronco world. It's not a, I don't want to be rude, but it's not a penis measuring contest. They want your Bronco to be better. They want to enjoy it with you. When I see somebody with a Bronco, I see somebody that appreciates something a little bit deeper in the car world. That's a stark contrast to most of his friends in their 20s for driving secondhand compact imports. They're just driving to drive. They probably have a nine to five and it's not a big deal. If that car got ran over by a steamroller, it wouldn't matter, right? It's just a thing. But when I see somebody with a Bronco, I think I see somebody that appreciates a piece of Americana. I think I see somebody that appreciates the ability to go and explore, uh, I mean, from beach coming to wood trimming, you know what I mean? Just out in the woods, just getting it. Over the past couple of months, Matthew has had his eye on what the new Broncos will look like. 
I feel like if they can figure out how to blend modern day technology and the beauty and the simplicity of an early Bronco and not make it like the Starship Enterprise on the inside, uh, I think they're going to be into some real luck. I'm definitely feeling the two door more. I think that's just a traditionalist in me, but I think there's points to the four door. There's people that really need that, that have kids, but want to have a Bronco. People are pumped for another option. They really are. And to see the Bronco be revived is just a, something for Americans in general could be excited about. It's nice to see an old brand be revived in like a, an American way. Well, we started with the American dream. So I guess we'll end with the American way. This has been Bring Back Bronco, the untold story. Be sure to tell your friends to check us out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever they want to find us. I'm Sonari Glinton. Thank you for joining me on this wild ride.